thanking you that you loved us enough to wake us up this morning. You gave us a reasonable portion of health and strength, the activity of our limbs, clothed us in our right mind, and you allowed us to travel these dangerous highways and byways and come to your house one more time to study your words. So we come thanking you this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that are present, all that are in route, and all that are looking this way by faith. We thank you for the ones that are watching this live stream. We come, O oh, Heavenly Father, thanking you for you being God and God all by yourself. We just love you this morning. And come praying and asking your choices, blessings upon our teacher pastor, praying that you will strengthen him as he goes through his bereavement. We thank you for all the other people that are in bereavement this morning, the sick, the shut-in. We pray and ask you, oh, Heavenly Father, that you will strengthen them. We thank you and we love you. We come asking these and all blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you. And Reverend Hunter. Amen. Everybody good on their lessons, the handout for your binders? Do so we're all, everyone's current? Great. Amen. All right, we're uh we just love the Lord and we're looking forward to continuation in this lesson lesson in Second Corinthians. Uh, as we grow and as the body of Christ and as we believers begin to just apply the word of God to our lives. Amen. So, Pastor, we're ready. Let us give our pastor some love. Amen. Man, God is a good God, and he is worthy to be praised. We are thankful to Almighty God for an opportunity again to study his word. want to welcome you to our uh, uh, midday midweek Bible study, a very interesting and a very timely uh, lesson, uh, especially as my family and I began to gather to celebrate my mom's life, uh, going back to the center of the universe, and uh, we're going to gather as a family on this weekend and uh, tell the Lord thank you. Uh, this lesson is on the heels of a lesson that we completed at our last gathering. We just completed lesson nine. Uh, lesson nine encompassed for us. One day we're going to have this right. There you go. Uh, I understand that we had some frequency issues last time, so we're going to see if change of frequency helps us out. Lesson 9 was entitled, Getting the Most Out of This Life. And uh, uh, I oftentimes remind people that <clears throat> uh, this, this life, in the midst of its complexity, actually has some very simple uh, processes that are, are to be followed, and you get, gain great favor when you buy an automobile uh, from the dealership you go and get that automobile, <clears throat> and no matter whether it's a uh, little first-timer uh, get-around car or one of those big luxurious luxury cars that uh, you see every now and then, they come with an owner's manual. In the glove compartment, there is a document there. It tells you everything you need to know about that car. It tells you how to get the most out of that car. It tells you that if you use this uh, grade of gasoline, you know, you, you know, premium, regular, extra, they got all these blends. And even airplanes can't use car, amen, gasoline. You need aero fuel. But um, the truth is, is that you can use that stuff in anything. You can use any of that. You can use the cheapest stuff. Amen. The problem is, is you won't get the most out of the equipment that it was designed for. 
in your instruction manual, it tells you that if you have such and such an automobile, you are expected, or that car is designed to use premium. Uh, it can tell you the uh, viscosity of the oils that you're expected to use, and, and you can go and you can, you can get uh, something on sale if you want to. And uh, he, here's the kicker, and this is what gets most people. The cars still go. I'm going somewhere. Cars still go. It'll still operate. You can get around. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. The problem is, is that if you don't follow those instructions, you won't get out of that automobile what was designed for you to get out of it. And don't miss this. It won't last as long. Now, People are a lot like that. We come with an owner's manual too. It's called the Holy Bible. Amen. You know, that automobile, most people that buy that automobile, they don't know much about cars, but they know how to drive them. Same way with people. People think they know how to live, and so nobody ever hardly opens that, auto, that, uh, that uh, uh, manual, that owner's manual. Matter of fact, some of us got cars we've been driving around in for seven, eight years and still got the seal on that owner's man. You talk to me if you can. You know, you, you, you don't need to know. You don't need to know some of this. Some of us got things in that car you haven't used yet. You paid for it. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, some, some of us got those backup directional things that if you disengage it. I know mine came, my car came with a uh, it, it'll actually park itself. Did you, do you know how they, those things will park themselves? Yeah, it'll park itself. The problem is they wanted me to pay for a subscription to make it happen every year. I said, thank you. I appreciate it. May the Lord bless you. And so that particular feature is dormant in that car, but it's designed to do it. I guess what I'm saying is that just like that automobile, if you don't follow those instructions for fuel and oil, the viscosity and all of that, you won't get out of that car what was designed for you to get out of that car. We come with a manual, it's called the Bible. Now just like that car and us not opening that owner's manual, look, you don't have to follow God's word. You don't have to, and your life, you can, it'll continue to roll on. Yes, you will. Because most folk think, just like they think, that they don't need to follow the rules of the road and they don't need to put in that car. As a matter of fact, rental car companies will tell you that uh, you can put regular in it. And most of us have subscribed to that. I put regular in this car. It don't have, yeah, they say premium, but I don't But you're not going to get out of it what it was designed for. And most of us don't care when it's rental cars because that ain't our car. You can talk to me. Yeah, ain't our car. I just wanted to get me where I'm going. And if it don't last as long, that's their problem. But as it relates to us, if we don't follow the manual, everything in that manual, God has given to us for our good. Now, you don't have to follow it. And life will roll on. The problem is, is that we won't get out of life what we were designed to get out of life and it won't last as long. In lesson nine, the background about for getting the most out of life, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, uh, told us that if we were to get out of life the most we could, then we had to be emphatic about it. We need to be bold. We need to go after it because God has designed us to be bold and go after it. Not to beat people over the head, but be emphatic about our life. Now, this is what I choose. I choose to go to heaven. You may not want to go with me, but I choose. I, I, I'm emphatic. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to take everybody I can with me. Not only that, evangelistic. That's the part that says I'm taking everybody with me. Do you not know that the sole purpose of God leaving his church here after we're saved is so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the Lord can take us on home once we get saved. 
but we are partnering with him. He has allowed us in our feeble clay as we are to partner with the divine awesome God such as he is. So we want to be evangelistic. I know if, if you love folk, you ought to want to take them with you to a land of no more. But finally, uh, stop walking around with your head hung down. Be eternity minded. Know that we got somewhere to go. Let me tell you something. When my mother, now my, my mother, I was telling our sisters when we first got in here, first two or three in here, um, we were expecting my mom to go home to be with the Lord for, for a couple of weeks. And uh, when I got the word, uh, I was rejoicing. I'm sad that I'm not going to get to see her here, but I don't want her in pain. Uh, she know where she going and so do I and after 90 years three months 23 days and a little change she graduated to her home in glory and I'm excited because that's what she worked for a great woman of faith and our family's going to gather and we're going to celebrate let me tell you something there's a difference when you live your life for Christ and when you just making it up as you go. And so we want to get the most out of life. But once we've dealt with getting the most out of life, lesson 10 helps us to talk about that next phase. I told you this lesson was very timely for, for me, if not for you. It's what happens when I die. What happens when I die? Well, the backdrop for this lesson is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We hear a lot of this quoted during funeral services. The problem is we most often don't, don't know the background for it and why Paul wrote what he wrote when he wrote it. And that's called context. Remember, Paul is dealing with the folk at Corinth, and uh, he's having a problem with some of those boogers. Corinth is probably one of the most carnal churches that Paul or any other apostle has to deal with throughout this Bible. And he's calling them back to themselves because it's some false teachers have gotten involved. They've become threaded, entwined into the body of Christ and they've begun to influence folk and to draw them away from the teachings that Paul and other uh, have shared with them about the faith. And so Paul, after telling them how to get the most out of life, he talks to them about what happens when a believer dies. What happens? Background, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. And there's a lot of interest usually around this particular uh, lesson about what happens when we die. Now, there's a lot of different scenarios based on who you talk to. Some people, as a matter of fact, uh, in seminary, I teach uh, uh, a course about uh, re various religions, world religions, as a matter of fact. And a lot of world religions have a lot of this, and it's, well, that's why most people teach uh, that we just keep coming back until we get it right. That's, that's what a lot of people say. They say, well, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, when you die, you come back. You know, you come back as a cricket. You know, come back as a frog. or Come back as an eagle or an emu or, or whatever based on how you did what you did here. Okay? Um, this is called reincarnation. Now, that's the word that describes that particular understanding of people who believe and teach that you just keep coming back. You just don't come back as you are. You come back either at a lower level if you didn't get 50 percent, you know, right. And if you got more than that, then you come back at a little bit higher level. But you come back here. In other words, you come back here to go through hell some more. 
until you reach until you reach what they call enlightenment. But I digress. Uh, reincarnation or that particular idea, really, uh, when you look at it, when you turn it upside down, you look at it. Really, it's really Satan's original lie. Satan basically said, "You shall not die," and that, that's really what this says. Okay, yeah, that, that's all this this says. It's, it's a fancy way of saying, "Yeah, yeah don't, don't don't believe what what God said. You you shall not surely die." Genesis three and four is what uh, helps us. It reminds us about that. It says, the, but the word of God tells us that we only have one life to live, and that's it. And that life is not ended at physical death. So the Bible talks to us in great detail about God's design and who we are, why we're here, and what we're supposed to do while we're here. And the whole reason for it. The word of God goes into great detail about that. The problem is, is that we haven't broke the seal off of the manual. According to Hebrews 9 and 23, what happens when we die? In this lesson, Paul reveals three things that happen when I die. Those three things. What's the first one? I will, somebody say will. I will receive a new body. Yeah, this one is subject to a lot of hurt. Subject to a lot of innuendo and you know, some of us mess up our body early in life. Some of us hang on to late in life. Some of us, you know, God makes it so good for us we gluttonize this one. And, uh, amen. <laughs> they don't rub it in. Man, I didn't even see you there. <laughs> but I will receive a new body. Okay? What's the other thing that happens when I die? I will be with the Lord. You and the Lord, stop worrying about it. <laughs> Glory to his name. That's why I'm telling you my family is gathering this weekend, but there are no bad days in Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us death can't hurt you. Did you hear what I just said? And that's one of the reasons we've invested our life. We've invested our soul in Christ. Okay, who wouldn't serve a God like that? But finally, there's something else that happens when I die. I will be judged. Now for the believer this judgment is not a judgment of, of uh, condemnation. It's a judgment that determines your reward. The sad thing for believers as it relates to judgment is that you can lose a lot of your reward based on what you fail to do here and even fail to do with the right motive. But let's talk about this. What happens when I die. Number one, I will receive a new body. Now, Paul continues to contrast between things seen and the present. He started giving this contrast. So he starts talking about things that we see, things that are right now in the present, such as the problems we have, uh, the trials and tribulations, issues we have with our children, uh, circumstances that come up, even having to deal with death, all, all of that. And he contrasts all of that with the wonderful things that are not seen, which are awaiting us in eternity. So Paul is doing an excellent job of doing a contrast. He does this little dance between showing you all the issues related to what's happening in our present and what is there in eternity. He does this contrast, does this little dance. That's why in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, he says, while we look not, he says, don't look at all of this. He says, it's going on and you're going to deal with it. He says, but don't focus on this. He says, while we look not at the things, what you're seeing, that's what's going on. 
I mean, what, that's the present. He says, but we're to look at what? Things which are, wait a minute, isn't that, that's kind of a, kind of, he said, look at, okay, now, now, don't miss that. He said, look at the things which are not seen. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I, I'm going to look at the things which are not seen. And then he tells us why. There's a colon behind that. He says, for the things which are seen are temporal. They, they're temporary. He says, stop focusing on stuff. The word, and we're going to come to this a little later on. The word temporary or temporal means passing away. It means the stuff that's temporary has moved on. You get, I'm going somewhere. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Those are the spiritual things, the eternal things, the everlasting things. Then look at how Paul continues in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the first part of verse 1. What does he say? He says, for we know. Now, if you've ever, I also teach a, a class about Paul in the seminary, and Paul is a very interesting study. Paul, whenever he has elaborated a lot on something, Paul gives you credit for knowing some stuff if he's told you more than a couple of times. And so Paul says, for we know. Now he's talking to folk in the church there at Corinth, even though Corinth got some problems. He says there's some things we just ought to know by now. And most of us, if you're in Bible study, that tells me you, you've been in the Lord and you actually been trying to study God's word for a little while. There's some stuff you ought to know by now. But our Bible study is meant to encourage and shore you up so you can continue to walk on in the midst of the right now. For we know, what do we know, Paul? That if our earthly house of this what? Tabernacle, what happened to it? We're dissolved. He said it's passing away. It's here, but it's going to dissolve. He, now, now uh, I, I want to I say something to you here. Uh, have y'all noticed, and I, I, I think I share this every now and then, you'll, in your Bible study, we'll say things like chapter such and such, verse such and such, and we'll have a, a letter behind it. We'll say A or B or C or something like that. That's, that's for your study. Same, same reason that we have chapters. And verses, those, those were not there when they were written by the authors. In other words, Paul didn't say chapter 5, verse so-and-so. These were there so that for the purpose of study. And when it puts the little letters back there, it's using the punctuation. So when you come to the first punctuation in this verse, what's the first punctuation? No, the per first punctuation is that comma. That's the first punctuation. That's A. After that punctuation, you come to the next punctuation, which is another. So what's between that first comma and the second comma? That's called B. Okay? What's the third uh, punctuation? That period. That between the comma and the period, they will refer to as C. So when you're studying... And you see something like A, B, C. Now, I'm telling you that because I don't want you to get confused on the next lesson because the next lesson is a verse that's so long, I think it breaks up and goes all the way into the chapter, the verse, and I, or J. Because it's got so much punctuation in it. But you'll know what they're referring to. And I try to do that for you when we come here by highlighting certain pieces. So when you study... That's what some of these books are referring to when they say chapter 5, verse 1, B. Then you'll know what they're talking about. Amen? Amen. But in this particular situation, they say chapter 5, verse 1, A. They're talking about this first part. They're referring to, they're focusing on what Paul says in the first part of this verse. He says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle if it were dissolved. Now, 
he's going to be dealing with some things that has to do with that. Because according to Acts 18 and 3, Paul was a tent maker by trade. Y'all walking with me? In other words, his secular job, just like you go get him go to a job every day, Paul was uh, a Pharisee, but he was also a Jew. Well, what does that mean, preacher? Well, every Jewish male was required by his dad, required by the law under his dad, to have a trade and to have the trade that his dad had. So dad was responsible for teaching his son his trade. Yeah. Amen. Interestingly, uh, even Jesus, because he came up under the law, according to the law, and Joseph, his earthly father, what, what trade was Joseph? That's right. How do we know that? That's what he taught Jesus to be. That's why we refer to him as a carpenter, because that's what Joseph was. According to the law, every Jewish father was required by the law to teach his son the trade of his trade. And here's what the Bible says, so that he wouldn't steal, so that he wouldn't have to steal. Uh. Amen. So Paul was a tent maker. That's what he did. That's what he had been trained to do by trade. And when he went on mission and he was no longer operating as a Pharisee, the Pharisees were taken very well. Let me tell you something. Pharisees were not just Johnny come lately. They were very, they were wealthy men. They had things given and granted to them. Uh, portions of the tax were given to them. They, they were the elite. As a matter of fact, the word Pharisee means the separated ones. They were the ones that were the elite. They were the creme de la creme of Israel. They were even the upper crust in the Sanhedrin council. They had the casting vote. Are y'all going to walk with me? This is what Paul was, but Paul gave all that up. He gave all that up. We're going to talk a lot more about that in the next lesson. But he gave all that up because he said, I, I, I want to make a better investment. And his better investment was in Jesus Christ. I'm just trying to tell you that you made a good investment. Okay? So, because Paul was a tent maker, he began to compare the human body to a tabernacle, to a tent. Okay? And so, when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he talks about, and we know. And he used, compares about the, this earthly tabernacle, not made with hands. So he's comparing your human body to a tent. Now, why in the world would he compare the body to a tent? Because a tent has always been a symbol of what is temporary or what the Bible calls transitory. Today we would say portable, something portable. If you want to go camping, you want to go out into the woods. And when I was in the military, we had uh, tents. They called them pup tents when they were small, but they were tents. We had headquarter tents. We had different size, but th they were transitory. The purpose was that you could move them easily from place to place. And what Paul says is that what you living in now and you moving around transitorily here in this earthly uh, life that we live, he say, you just living in a tent right now. You say, this is your move around tent. The author of this study, this particular study, he had his own illustration uh, about how a tent is an example of our temporary bodies. And uh, I thought it would be good to share it's in your manual, but it's good to read as we start talking about more about uh, what happens when I die, because it is a great illustration. The author says, when my family and I lived in Arkansas, he said, we often went tent camping at Lake Greeson for summer vacations. We would set up our tent. Has anybody ever gone camping and you set up a tent? Yeah. You know, and if you have a tent of any size, you have to know what you're doing. 
And you, you, you know, some people they see that stuff on TV and they jump their little happy self out there and start, yeah, yeah, man. They think they see people go to the stream and get fish and start, yeah, and you go out there with your little, amen, string, uh, thinking you're going to catch fish and everything. You'll starve to death out there if you don't know what you're doing. Amen. So he says, we set up our tent knowing that in a week, he said, but we set this tent up and we were happy. We're going to have a good time. But we were knowing that in a week or so, we would take it down when vacation was over and the tent had served its purpose. I'm going to hang on that. The tent had served its purpose. The tent had served its purpose. The tent had served its purpose. So we would take it down and go home to a much better place to live. I think that's a great illustration as we talk about what happens when we die. Because that's what happens uh, at death. It's just like that for a Christian. We move out of our temporary bodies. We move out of our tents, which the Bible calls tents because they, we have these temporary bodies. Remember, the word temporary or temporal means that which is passing away. After leaving our earthly tent, we have a building of God. A house, notice he doesn't refer to this as tent though. A house, and house is always that which identifies with permanence. Yeah, now I understand that our earthly houses here Amen. They, they're passing away too. But here in the Greek, Paul uses a word which implies permanence. He says we have a building of God and house, because it's built by God, not made with hands, and it's what? Eternal. That means everlasting in the heavens. That's why it refers to that B part of chapter 5. Verse 1, the building of God refers to the resurrected or glorified body we will receive when Christ returns. Now, what does Philippians, now Paul wrote to the Philippians as well, but Paul has something to say, and he usually writes a lot, he writes a lot about uh, what happens to the believer. And so you're going to find some of what he says all throughout a lot of his writing. Paul says to us in Philippians 3 and 21, notice again, the letter A, he says the first part of what he wrote in verse 21, it reveals, it shows us, uh, or reveals will happen when Christ returns. He says, who shall change our vile body, okay, that it may be fashioned. He says, and, and, and this reveals a whole lot that we don't have time. He says that this very body that we have is not going to be totally done away with. He say it's going to go through its process, but God's going to take it and he's going to fashion it. Are y'all walking with me? He's going to fashion it like unto a, or like unto his glorious body. So he's going to remake this body. Okay? I heard somebody one time say that. I, I, how's God going to do all that? Some people are lost at sea. Quails eat them up. Some people are burned up and the ashes are spread everywhere. And you know, I marvel at questions like that because I'm like, uh, so you're telling me that that's impossible for God? Yeah, that's impossible. Wait a minute. You got to remember, God took nothing. Amen. And made everything. Is there anything too hard for God? This is a small thing. He says, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Yeah, his body. And because Paul's life was very different, Paul didn't have a cakewalk life. It was cakewalk right up until he invested in Jesus Christ. Okay? 
He wrote verses 2 and 3, and here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 2. He says, for in this, well, in what? Remember, he was talking about, and we know, that if our earthly house, uh, this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in that. Remember what he just said, eternal in the heaven. And he says, for in this, what? This tent, this, this body that we're in now, in this we what? We groan. Yeah, we, we're going through some stuff, so that's some hurt. Yeah, that's, that's some things we're going to have to go. He said, for in this we groan, we're earnestly, what are we earnestly doing? We're desiring to be clothed upon with our house. That's that same word he used in verse 1. He said, we long, we want that permanent building that God has for us. We're longing for that, which is from heaven. He said, we want that. We groan as believers going through all of this junk, having to deal with the ups and downs of life, doing the best that you can, the good best of his service, and still stuff not working out right. He said, oh, we've grown. I think about uh, my mom in her old age, and as she began to, her steps got slower and slower until she uh, became bedridden for a few months, and her steps had already gotten close. And I heard the words that she would say over and over again, and you only start listening to it after you heard it for a while. And she would say quite often, she'd say, I'm praying, Jesus, come get me whenever you're ready. I'm ready. And then I started listening. I say, oh, okay. Because she said it, and I, I heard it. Yes, yeah, okay, mama, yeah. She said, Lord Jesus, uh, I'm ready. Whenever you're ready to come get me, I'm ready. And I knew she was for real. Because we groan. We groan in our own ways. We groan. We groan because we're earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, that permanent house, that permanent body, that permanent building, which is from heaven. 2 Corinthians 5 and 3 says, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. He said, there is no space for nothingness when we leave here. He said, we don't become homeless. <laughs> that's, that's not how this works. He said, you're never without. We don't become naked just because we come out of this tent. This clearly contradicts the idea that in heaven we will be spirits without bodies. And people have said that, yeah, you're waiting for your next body so that you can come back again and come back as a, a roach. Some people are teaching that you're on this long chain, you're waiting. And you, you know. I'm going to be a roach any minute now. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting on my turn to be, 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 that, be that next goat, you know, whatever it is. No. The Bible doesn't teach such a thing. Not at all. Instead, we will each have our house. There's not some mass glob where all of us are just thrown into it. It says we will each have our house, which is from heaven, or what you can refer to as a new glorified body. 2 Corinthians 5 and 4 says it like this, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Yeah. And we're groaning because we're burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed. In other words, we don't want to die. Are y'all with me? But we want to be clothed upon. Why? That mortality might be swallowed up of life. We want the mortality that God has for us to swallow all of this up. We don't want to be done away with. We just want to be swallowed up so that we move up. We have a better home, a better, a better life. This means while we groan in our earthly bodies, we don't look forward to a time when we will be unclothed or have no bodies. That's not what we look forward to. There's no such thing. That's why, you know, while we may reverence and respect 
our cemeteries, but there's really no need to visit mama in the cemetery. Mama ain't there. I mean, great respect. And it's all right, leave flowers. That's fine. You, know, you can clean it off. Uh, no problem. But that's for you. Uh, that, that's for you. I don't want weeds growing up around mama's. <laughs> so I'm going to pull the weeds. But that's for us. Daddy, big mama, they not there. And they don't want to be there. Jesus' own resurrected body proves this. When Jesus first appears to his disciples after his resurrection, he says, peace be unto you in John 20 and 19. Then what does our Lord do according to John chapter 20, verse 20? Here, look at the letter, B. All right, what does he say? Well, as that B position says, and when he had so said, what does B say? He showed unto them. Yeah. He showed them. He said, look. He said, look. It's me. He said, y'all saw what just happened to me. He said, look, look at that. He said, it's me. I kept that so you'll know it's me. Bible says, look at verse 20 on out. He says, then were the disciples what? They got happy. When they saw the Lord. Let me tell you something. I'm going to jump for joy when I see, I see my mama again. And I have every expectation to do so. And you'll be able to do the same thing, Alice. What I'm trying to tell you is that I know my Savior has this in hand. Paul continues, he writes that our spirits will not be unclothed or naked, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. This means we want to put on our new bodies so our mortal or dying bodies will be, what, swallowed up of life. We want that. That's what we want. We don't want to have it be done away. We want life to just engulf it all so that we can live at that next, at a higher level. The phrase swallowed up of life refers to the complete redemption of our body. How is this described in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verse 54, because Paul has talked about some of this before. Well, here's what 1 Corinthians 15 and 54 said. So when this corruptible, what corruptible? This that's been, you know, been embraced by sin, no matter how good or holy we think we are, all of us got some, some sin. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Amen. We've thought the wrong things. We've done some of the wrong things. I remember when I was young, that was just some stupid stuff I used to do that I wouldn't even think about doing now. But then I thank God for grace. Amen. Amen. And I know, I know now, you with your little holy self, you did some crazy stuff too. You're just not telling nobody. Amen. And if I were you, I wouldn't tell nobody either. Amen. He says, so when this corruptible shall have what? Put on incorruptible. So when, when the, my corruptible has put on incorruption, he's talking about the incorruption swallowing up that corruption. And this mortal, in other words, this, this human part of me, shall I put on immortality. That spiritual has gulped up the mortal. Then, he says then, in other words, that has to happen first. He says, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, what? See, I, I, I'll shout and run right now. Then death will be swallowed up in victory. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like when all of that happens? We're going to be some crazy folk. <laughs> Lord going to have to say, settle down. Settle down, settle down. We got a lot to do. Come on. And I know that's the truth because even when we do our welcome here, we have to say, settle down, settle down, settle down. We still got a lot. Amen. Paul uses the word earnest. That's that word, earnest. He uses that word in verses 5 of 2 Corinthians when he speaks of one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has a big part 
at this particular point. The word translated earnest, now that's not somebody's name that we're talking about. The word translated earnest means a down payment or deposit. They still use that word, that term in a mortgage when you buy realty. And they say, you need to put down earnest money. That's right. You know why they say you need to put down earnest money? That's right. Because now that shows you're vested. You, you got an interest in what you're moving forward with. It ensures that you're going to lose if you don't come back and make this good. Well, I need you to know that when Christ died, amen, he put earnest down to prove he's coming back to make this good. His earnest is the Holy Spirit. That's why he indwells, okay? Uh, Holy Spirit may seem like a vague guarantee, but we can't see or touch him. But we can see and experience what he produces in our life. Holy Spirit is responsible for preparing us for that next phase. You see, he gets us ready down here. He guides us through some of the shark-infested waters here, amen, with our little happy self. We're running around. We can run into the freeway. But, but I thank the Lord for Jesus. He left the Holy Spirit so that we wouldn't have to take this walk alone while we are waiting for the corruptible to have been swallowed up by, uh, from that incorruption. That mortal having been overcome by victory. Amen? But we can see the experience of what produced in our life by this earnest of the Holy Spirit. He produces the character of Jesus Christ in our lives. I've heard and talked to people who have this idea uh, of one or the other. People want to either talk, they would say, well, we talk about the Holy Spirit. Somebody else say, well, we talk about Jesus. That's the craziest disagreement of ever. You can't talk about one without the other. Jesus is the one that ensures that we have and the Holy Spirit indwells us. The Holy Spirit prepares us for him. So to speak about one without the other is ridiculous, especially for the believer. He produces, he who, the Holy Spirit produces the character of Jesus Christ in our lives. Let me tell you something. Without him, I can't become more and more like Jesus Christ. This is called the fruit of the Spirit. Paul talks a lot about it when he wrote to those crazy folk at Galatia. Which is, called, which is a word picture for Jesus Christ. Yeah, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, I want to share again with you. I think I shared this before. When you study the Bible or study, you know, there, there's a course that they call, uh, you learn Greek. You learn uh, it just any other language. Um, when you see a list in the Bible, when you're studying the New Testament and you see a list, there's a list in it. Well, in Greek, because the New Testament was originally written in Greek, when you see a list, the Greek language uses priority for list. So every time you see a list, the first thing listed in the list is the most important. In other words, all the other things really are beholden to the first thing. So when you see the first thing, all the other stuff comes along as a result of it, okay? Look at Galatians 5 and 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Okay, now, this is a, a list that they wrote in Greek. So what's the first thing? Okay, so everything that comes after it is beholden to love. In other words, you can't have no joy without... Now, let me share something else with you. In the Greek, that word... And there are a lot of English. English is raw. Our English language is raw because a lot of it is con dealt with uh, innuendos and it has to do with the content uh, of your language. Uh, English uses a lot of, well, let me give you an example. Guys, that when I was coming up, they say things like, uh, my road dog. Well, you know and I know 
when we're talking about buddies because we're not really dogs, or I hope not. But you understand, so English is that kind of thing. Greek is a very specific language of which English is not, okay? Um, there are a lot of synonyms in English where one word can give a, be given over to another word, it may mean the same thing and so forth. But in Greek, it's a very specific language. For instance, when we talk about love, the Greeks see four divisions of love. I just want to, I'm telling you that to give you an understanding of this word that's translated to our word love. The word eros. Eros is a word which refers to lust or eroticism, where you see, you go to the red light districts and you see all this where it says love for sale. Oh, yeah, y'all can talk to me. I, I, yeah. oh, I know you got your holy hat on. It's Wednesday. But. That, that's what, or when you find somebody down in the red light district, say, I uh, walk up to a, a girl or a guy, now they say, I want to make love to you. Here's my $50 or whatever. That's not love, okay? That's eros. Or philios. That's another Greek word which means love. But philios is one of those words that means I scratch your back, you scratch my back. As a matter of fact, it's used in one of our cities name we call it Philadelphia Phileas that's right that's why it's referred to as the city of brotherly love because that's what Phileas means it means brotherly love I got you you got me we're gonna take care of each other no problem but now if you don't take care of me I'm not taking care of you don't look for me to cover your back because you failed to cover my that I'm talking about Phileas Starge is another word for love in Greek. Starge is more of a relational or an, an ownership or an occupied kind of love. When you see people riding around and they have those bunkers, bumper stickers that say, I love my dog. Well, I don't love my dog like I love my wife. Well, some people, <laughs> well, let me, let me leave that alone. Huh? But you understand, right? You, 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 uh, or I love uh, balloon flying. I, I love kite flying. Uh, I, I, I love camping. Uh, that's Stargate because that's associational. In other words, when I say I love my dog, that doesn't mean I love your dog. That means I love my dog. I say I love my cousins. That's association. That don't mean I love your cousins, that means I love my cousin because that's association, that's Stargate. None of those words are used here in Galatians 5 and 22. The word that is used here is agape. Agape is also a Greek word which means love, but it is an unconditional love. In other words, the individual who has this kind of love can only get this kind of love from God because it is a God kind of love. And the Bible even defines it because the Bible says God is, and that's the word that's there where it says God is love. It defines agape. It says almighty God is agape. And so the fruit of the spirit when God is developing the man, the woman of God, of Christ Jesus, because they have accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit gets busy on the inside developing you with giving you all these things and preparing you to live in a glorified body. Are y'all walking with me? And the most important thing in it is this thing called agape. Because with agape, as the Holy Spirit develops and prepares you, then he makes sure that you experience joy in spite of what's going on in the world. He makes sure that you have peace that surpasses all understanding. That's why sometimes you can go into situations that are in turmoil and then you feel this rush of this sense of peace. Even though you're having to cry, you say, 
Oh, it's it's going to be all right. I, I feel it. Even in the midst of all of this, I feel this calm. That it's, it's all right. Sometimes you have to counsel yourself against yourself. I just don't want you to talk it out, out loud. You know it's going to be all right. I don't know if it's going to be all right. Yet. You, you better talk to you. Fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Look here, long-suffering. That means I'm patient because the Lord knows that you're going to have to put up with stuff that your old self wouldn't be willing to. I know that the Lord worked on me. I, I, I know he worked on me. Amen. Amen. And if you were honest, you'd know that you, you changed too. You may not be where you need to be, but you're not where you were. Gentleness comes out of agape. Goodness. Faith. The very idea that faith is a part of it. Don't stop now. Meekness. Amen. Temperance. Because the truth is, is they, amen, most of us, not some of y'all, y'all, y'all were easy going and everything, but I'm looking at y'all and y'all looking at me. Yeah, y'all, y'all could give people, amen, the best. Amen. You, you, you give them, bite, tell them to bite something off and chew it. And then you make them swallow it. Come on. See, I, 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 I'm looking at you. I'm, Sister Houston, I, let's see. I, where you? I see. Look at Sister Miles. You're right, yeah, yeah. You? No, okay, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah. Some of us still ready to tell folk where to go. Come on. Yeah. Sister Morales, I see you back there. Huh? Uh, all right, all right, all right. Meekness, temperance against such there is no law. The Holy Spirit is preparing us. He's developing us to live in heavenly places, in a glorified body. There are no bad days in Christ. Through the process of sanctification, in other words, God takes you, he takes me, he takes us, and he sets us aside to work on us. And it's a lifelong process. The Holy Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus. Now, you can cause delay to that. You can retard that. And that's why some of us have to learn the same lesson over and over again. Amen. But then that's another lesson. In this life, somebody say in this life. In this life, the Holy Spirit supernaturally produces a Christ-like transformation in our lives. That's what 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 tells us. That's why I said this, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You work, Paul. This is what we call the earnest from the Lord. It is our guarantee that he will transform us completely in the future by giving us glorified bodies. This is a big part of what happens when we die because when I die, I will get a new body. Philippians 1 and 6 tells us that I am sure he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion when my Lord returns. You see all these little scriptures that you learned in BTU, now you know where to put them, right? Amen. In other words, when I die, I will receive a new body. So when I die, this will happen for me. I will receive a new body. Now I'm going to pick up right here, and I'm going to tell you why I'm going to stop right here. Uh, I got word as I was coming in. Many of you remember Reverend Norman and Sister Norman. Sister Norman went home to be with the Lord earlier this morning. And uh, we're working with Reverend Norman. And I'm going to be leaving here going to Lockwood Funeral Home. We'll be sending that out to the leaders uh, so that they'll know. 
uh, Reverend Norman is one of my sons in the, in the faith. He pastors a little church not far from here. And uh, we're going to do all we can while we can to encourage and comfort him and his family as he takes this walk uh, in, uh, with his family to uh, say farewell and, and gather.